Welcome to Opera San Jose Talks about Moby Dick. I'm Larry Hancock, General Director at Opera San Jose, and with me today I have Jasmine Habersham mm-hmm. and Eugene Broncoviano. 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 There you go. There you go. <laughs> and it looks like it even Broncoviano. Exactly. Um, so we're going to be talking about Moby Dick and. Uh, We have two very interesting characters here, and as a matter of fact, uh, I'll talk about Eugene. You're not only singing Stubb, you're also covering Starbuck. That's right. So you have a double duty here. Mm -hmm. And Jasmine, you're singing Pip, uh, a little boy. Yes. Uh, What, about 11? (laughs) Something like Uh, that? 14. He's 14. Yeah. It's late for his voice to be changing. Yeah. Mm. So, <laughs> yeah. It's all that salt in the air. <laughs> so, um, the two I have to say, the two characters in the opera that most fascinate me are, uh, que- uh, are, are Greenhorn and Pip. They're the two most mysterious mm. and the two with a great deal to do. And we are left guessing at who the, and what they are. It, and in Pip's case, even what you are for me. Uh, I'm not certain what Pip is. Um, Pip starts out a little boy. Yeah. But then Pip is lost overboard. And Queequeg f- eventually finds Pip. While the chorus is singing Lost in the Heart of the Sea. And pulls Pip on his back and swims back to the boat and manages to save Pip. Right. But we get in Pip's aria that Pip has drowned. But suddenly Pip is back and among us. Mm-hmm. A totally different being, though. Exactly. Because of that experience of A drowning. totally different being. And to me, I feel like the character... Um, being that it's had that traumatic experience that it sees into these other worlds and also can see the future and the past and everything of what's going to happen to this, you know. And you share that. Yes. (laughs) You got no brakes and no clutch. (laughs) Right. (laughs) If it comes into Pip's mind, it's going to come out of Pip's mouth. Exactly, yeah. And he doesn't mince words. No. Just said, this is, I have seen him. Right. And I saw you, Captain. Right. And again, I think Pip serves serves as the foreshadowing for a lot of, again, the events to come. And and kind of, I think, shifts the opera from, you know, we were taking this really awesome voyage. And then as things change, you know, when the drowning happens, it just goes downhill from there. Ahab loses it at the same time. Yes. And also, I think it's the relationship to... Pip's, everyone's relationship to Pip, you can see how they react to it. And I think that is telling about what's really happening in a story. Because Ahab at that point, he doesn't care that I drown. He's just so adamant about looking for Moby Dick that he's just lost all sense of compassion and care. So I think with each character, you see how everyone reacts to me drowning but it also is telling of what the mental state and and uh, where everything is going. Ahab is finally tender with you after you have drowned. Yes. Because I, I kind of suspect that Ahab knows this, this is not going to end well for him. Oh, yeah. I think he knows. Totally. He indicates it a few times. Uh, when, he, when he tells Starbuck, you are not to lower, Mr. Mm-hmm. Starbuck. He, because he knows you won't see me again. Yeah, this is it. Yeah. It's a one-way mission. And he has no business out of being mm. a harpooner. Mm. I mean, he's the captain of the ship. He's not a harpooner. And, yeah. and, and yet, there he, he goes out and he takes over the harpoon. Mm-hmm. So we've already leaped all the way to the end of the opera, and that's not, what, <laughs> that's not the plan here. I, I had a plan here. You're singing all over the place. I saw you in Utah. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, that's right. Yes, because we met at the... At, at the reception. That's right. yes. And I said, yes. I hope you'll be available yeah. for Pip with us. <laughs> and it, it ended up and happening. It turned, yes, yeah. and it looked like it was not going to happen. Yeah. And, and then here it is, exactly. and here you are, because I so loved your performance there. Oh, thank you. And, um, thank you. It was, uh, I loved that show. I yeah. mean, and, It was and that very same production. This mm-hmm. same yeah. production, absolutely. And it was just beautifully done, I thought. And... Uh, I, I was convinced that we were going to bring the show. 
uh, if we could possibly figure out a way to do it. I didn't know about the Utah co-production availability. I didn't know they were doing anything because what do I know? I'm stuck out here in the middle, on the edge of the continent, right? Um, but uh, I called the funder Carol Frank Buck and said, we've been talking about Moby Dick as we talked about Silent Night and she helped fund our production of Silent Night. I said, would you consider, because if you're not interested in it, then we're not interested in it because we can't do this. But we feel about Moby Dick that it is one of the great operas that can't be performed in a small house. And just as Silent Night couldn't be performed in a smaller mm -hmm. house. And when I say small, I mean our size. Um, so we would like to build a new production that, that could travel. And she said, call Utah Opera. She didn't tell me why. She said, I am interested and I want you to call Utah Opera. So I called Utah Opera and found out that they were looking for co-producers. So the day before the opening in Salt Lake, we got our award letter. Oh, wow. The day be. before that opening. Meant so to, to be. We're, John, I hope you have the evening <clears throat> free because we're going to Salt Lake. Yeah. <laughs> and we arrived, went directly from, from the airport to the theater, yeah. and we were walked all through the set with their technical director. And then John stayed backstage and watched how the show worked from backstage while I went out into the hall and was very naughty, the kind of person you don't want in your theater. Uh, I moved from place to place. Ah, to get so I lines. could see it yeah. from wherever. How is it working? And they have a hall that was conducive to that. Mm -hmm. It's a kind of a complicated setup. And you sort of, I never did sit in my real assigned seats. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's a beautiful hall there, and I'm excited about the California because I've heard that's beautiful. Also, the California theater. Oh, you theater. love it. Yeah, the California is a charming yeah. theater. It's so yeah. beautiful. It's a charming theater. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, I was I was bound to determine we were going to bring it before I ever got there, and then oh. saw it. I was so <laughs> delighted with everybody I, and the choreography and the whole thing. Yeah. And so, and of course, I I got to meet the stage director. Christine was also at, at the reception, and she and I talked about the possibility of her coming out. And yes. uh, a lot of things got settled right there at the reception. It was great. Uh, and now here we are. We have loaded the scenery into the theater. And pretty soon we're going to, and tonight there's a special session for Queequeg and Greenhorn. I don't know who else, but those persons who go up onto the mast, because that's tricky dicky. Right, and for the, the harnesses. That's right, because yeah. ain't nobody going to climb up there without a harness on. That's not going to happen, because when I saw that thing, and I saw the tiny little disc up there that stands in for a crow's nest, and it didn't have any kind of a rail at all, yeah. mm -hmm. just empty up there, I said, mm -hmm. nobody in my company is going to go up there. <laughs> it's not going to happen. And then I discovered, that oh, okay, they have a wire, and, yeah. and everybody's in a harness, and you climb up inside mm -hmm. the mast before you come out, so there's no real danger yeah. as long as you're a normal person. Um, so anyway, those guys are going to go try that out tonight and be sure that the, so we can see how to hook them yeah. in the harness and not use rehearsal time for it. And that'll happen tonight. And then tomorrow night is the cue to cue when very little happens at mm -hmm. this cue to cue, but how the ships work, how the, the whale boats work oh, and, and all that kind of stuff. Incredibly important. Yeah. yeah. So we will, we'll, our technical crew will understand exactly how all that works. Mm -hmm. So there won't be any stopping for that when you guys arrive the next day. Uh, and then you'll be running the show on the mm. stage. We'll see about running the show on the stage. <laughs> I t I, it's the strangest thing. You spend 21 days in rehearsal on a space that is mm -hmm. exactly the same size and shape as the stage, right? Exactly the same. Yep. You get into the theater and it's like no one has ever seen this show yep. in their lives. Yeah, <laughs> it's a whole nother. Well, I think once we have, you know, we have the disc and we have that perspective, I think a lot of things will change because people really will be able to see. Yeah. yeah. And also to work up high. That too. Because down here you're yeah. standing on a taped line. Yeah. But when we're there, you're going to be up high. Right. And also we have these adventurous leaps that we take on and off. Yes. But we're going to be in this cocooned <laughs> shell, right? Because yes. there's this wall. So yeah. <laughs> it's not that far to go from the disc to be like no. a, a bug on the windscreen. <laughs> right. <laughs> on yeah. the side And wall. even though we have the disc, it's still different when we have the bow. And, mm -hmm. and how we walk up the stairs and like what we were used to doing yeah. so it's yeah. but it beats work
doesn't yes. it? Yes. <laughs> it beats, it it beats whaling. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, is there anything uglier than whaling in the world? Oh, gosh. Now that I've been, you know, kind of immersing myself in, in yeah. this world, you could smell a whaling ship from five miles Jesus. out to sea. Oh. They reeked. Yeah. Because all that boiling down of the blubber didn't happen on the deck. It happened below the deck. In, a, in an enclosed space mm-hmm. where they have fires going and great big metal pots, so to speak, and boiling the blubber, and that fills the room with this aerosolized How could you fat. Breathe and in it, there? you can't. You can't. And, you, and it gets all over you. It permeates your clothes, your hair. Yeah, and as yeah, soon yeah. as your shift is over, every day you would just bathe and bathe and wash, but you couldn't repair your clothes. And these self sacrificing Christian Quakers. <laughs> did not inform them the cost of... They had clothes you could buy on ship. And they bankrupted those boys by never telling them how much the clothes cost. And they and just w- kept changing shirts and... And when they would get back, they discovered that they, they had... They were, they were, they they were had bankrupt. Wow. They owed. Yeah. Instead of making money on their trip, they owed money. So now, now they're indentured to have to work on the next ship that goes out. <laughs> So, yeah. <laughs> what would Jesus do? Capitalism. Right? <laughs> it's all capitalism. So, at any rate, I, I just can't imagine a worse life. And it was called hell. Okay. Every, t- every description about what goes on while the blubber is being rendered is called hell. And also the stripping, the flaying of the whale's carcass mm. and all, all these things. It, it's uh, a hideous life. And, and people who worked on it were uh, treated badly and spoken of ill because it was the bottom of the line in, in going to see the, the guys working whale boats with the bottom. And the richest city in America was New Bedford, Connecticut. The richest city in America. Because of whaling. Because of whaling. Wow. Until finally somebody discovered that there was oil in the ground in Pennsylvania. And knocked a great right. hole in it because that was cheap. You got it out of the ground, and you could re- refine it and make kerosene lanterns. So suddenly, spermaceti candles, which were unconscionably expensive, were no longer necessary. <laughs> you know what city was next in the richest cities in the country? San Francisco. I was about to say. Because yeah. in 1850, there was gold in the mm. Thar Hills. And, and all of a sudden, San Francisco became the richest city in America. Mm, wow. Both of those things went by the by, didn't they? Uh, but they, it was a big deal for a time. And the whaling industry was very rich because they spent very little money on getting the oil mm-hmm. and charged a great deal of money for the oil. So... Once you have a kind of a lock on something that's necessary for everybody, mm. you can make money. So, at any rate, I like stub. That sounds almost like, um, I like big stub and I cannot <laughs> lie. <laughs> you are the way you said it. Yes, oh, it's a great, it's a great role. role. Yeah, it's a great role. And uh, that day in rehearsal, when I saw the disc, and I, and Christine told me a little bit about the dance, and I said to her, "Well, I, can I futz around with it a little bit? Can I do some stuff?" I said, "Yeah, yeah, show me, show me, show me." So, uh, when I was fourteen, speaking of Pip, I did my very first uh, modern opera in Heidelberg, Germany. It was called Columbus, and we were taught this skip step by the Peruvian choreographer, which is you know right foot behind the left foot and at the same time you skip so it's ba-bum, 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 ba-bum. and if you look closely do you know that when I go ta frere and bloody add a boy pip and I start to do this skip step yeah. that's that step that I've kept yeah. ever yeah. since I've been as I learned as a 14 year old because it totally makes sense because <laughs> we learned it in the sailor scene in Columbus the, the opera Columbus in 1992 so and since then whenever I can whether it's Don Giovanni, um, you know, whatever I, I end up doing, I always try to sneak in a little bit of that step into that. <laughs> and then also came the, the jump off of the disc with that little cartwheel in the air, which I thought, surely she's not going to allow me to do it. And she said, yes, 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 keep it, keep it, keep it, keep doing it. So yeah, this is a, it's an athletic show. I uh, mean, it's, yeah. 
It's even Ikea for Ikea. Ahab. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> well, this leg, leg. well, yeah. poor Richard. He's in there. You know, half of his body is cocooned into this harness, massive thing. into this massive thing. And uh, but the fact that the leg just so completely disappears behind the coat is very impressive. You no, know? it's eerie. Yeah. And but you know, because we're talking about the physicality of it, you know, most of the things that I sing is I'm either running on stage or carrying you off or <laughs> jumping off of things. And so two uh, three days ago when I was singing Starbuck in the room run, all of a sudden I'm finding myself walking on and I stand and sing. <laughs> And then I pick up the gun and I sing. And I thought, oh, this is, this is so nice. This is so easy. <laughs> it's 400 pages more music, but it's easier. It's actually easier. Yeah. Uh, doing both of these roles, mm. uh, uh, Starbuck to me is quite an astonishment. <laughs> Somebody came up to me. We had a, a, an event for the Friends of Opera. They had their annual mm -hmm. big get-together. And uh, they said, why aren't you advertising at Starbucks? <laughs> said, because nobody at Starbucks has any inkling that it has to do with Moby Dick. <laughs> but you know, I would need to do like a pop up. Like, <laughs> you could just go sing Starbucks Aria randomly. Give me the white whale double foam latte on the double. <laughs> Do that. I've always well, been tempted. I, I yeah. stole this from somebody else, but I've always, when they say, and what name shall you say? Call me Ishmael. I've always wanted to say that in nice. Starbucks. Nice. I've always wanted to say that. Oh, I'll do that next time I'll go. <laughs> and I'll sing Ishmael. it. Call me, <laughs> with a pause, Ishmael. <laughs> See what happens. And then, and then, unless they sing it back to me when it's, it's ready, I'm not responding. <laughs> do you mean Ishmael? <laughs> All those things. What a, I mean, what an ending. Oh, brilliant. What a, it's just brilliant. You know, I, I just, I just, you know, in preparation for this about four months ago when I, when I, you know, got the, got the score and, and, um, and I couldn't believe when it arrived at my house. I thought, oh, there must be a, quite a bit of, you know, essays about it and treatments and commentaries. Like, no, nope, page That's one, overture, <laughs> last page, <laughs> call me Ishmael. Okay, great. Yeah. That's 612 pages. Okay. But, uh, um, you know, I, I, I watched this, this fantastic talk that Jake gave. I forget where he was, um, but it was on YouTube. And... Uh, the, the the twist of all twists that he places the very first line of the book to the very end of the opera. Great, so that the audience actually has to earn the voyage to that famous line. Well, the novel is being told as a memoir. Mm -hmm. So he already knows what we don't get to find out. Yeah, He already knows. He's been through it. It has happened to yeah. him. Yeah. And Gosh, I just talked about it this in, uh, in the in the last time through, but why not talk about it again? Because who's going to listen to all of these? Because your mother is has is not going to listen to their podcast. No, she's yeah, she's going to listen to this. <laughs> but she'll hear this one. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, so he's got a problem. Greenhorn has mm -hmm. a problem. We don't ever know Greenhorn's name, and that's mentioned at Yale. That's mentioned at Columbia. Whenever I've looked at any of these online mm -hmm. lectures on Moby Dick. Uh, we do not know his name. We never find out his actual name. And, but he, we know he's a kid in isolation because he has no money, no job, and he says he has no family, and he says he has no friends, and he proclaims Queequeg to be his only friend. These are out of his mouth. So this is who he is. And when he says, I'm, when, when was a, 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 a cold and rainy November in my soul, I have to look that up because I misquote it all the time. And he feels this isolation and he finds himself standing too long staring at coffin shops and joins the tail end of, of funeral processions going to cemeteries and that he has to forcefully stop himself from stepping out into the street and knocking people's hats off. Oh, yeah. He's... And he says, whenever this happens to me, which gives us already a history, right? Oh my, this, is, this happens this way. I set to see. So, and now he's going to see because he's already in this depressed, oh my God state. 
Mm -hmm. He's already frightened. Like cabin fever. He needs to get out. He's already frightened. Mm -hmm. So he goes to sea. And the thing that you presume, and we just talked about this a lot in the the last thing, so I should shut up. But the thing that one presumes he might find on a ship in a confined area is comradeship with all the other people on. But instead, he falls into a place where everyone is isolated. Pip is isolated. I, Stubb has a friend. Yeah, but I think he adapts to the populace in the sense uh, sooner or later every sailor experiences this this beautiful horizon that he looks at on day one and says, ah, oh, freedom. And then sure sure enough, I read this in one of the books about uh, sailors that I was reading up about, is that once you're on when you're um, on sea too long, you feel like the horizon's getting shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter. And indeed, at some point, it feels like if you go any further, people go, people start telling themselves, "I'm going to fall off the edge of the earth because it's just I've been here too long." So Stubb, in a way, has learned over many many voyages. Yeah, he's an old salt. Exactly to to keep everybody's spirit up, everybody's morale very high, and yeah, rules are rules, rules schmules, but let's. Let's, let's keep it as humane as possible. So whereas he, he really knows his stuff, he also knows when to let go and give it, you know. And he seems to be the only guy on board who knows how to take a pulse because he's the only one who says his pulse is very weak, you know. Well, I'm, I'm completely overwhelmed and fascinated by this thing. And I can see why in, in modern times, well, way back... Mm-hmm. Uh, in England, the reviews of the novel were one of the great novels. Mm-hmm. One, one of the, an Ahab, one of the great characters ever invented. Uh, but we didn't see it in this country. And only in the 1920s, when there were two different movies about Moby Dick that hit. And then there was the anniversary that came later of, of the publication and or maybe it was Melville's own anniversary because he was born in what 19 and died in 91 1819 to 1891 and so in 1919 the anniversary of his birth perhaps that's what it was but there was some big anniversary that people started looking again at his work and at Moby Dick and over the course of the 20th century now it's being hailed as the Mm -hmm. first great American novel not Scarlet Letter which is what I thought, always thought would be the first great American novel. But they're saying no, because this is absolutely unusual and different from everything else and radical. Uh, this book is not like any other novel you've ever picked up. It's all, it's all full of lectures, right? It's all full of essays. Um, and I think less than half the novel is actually the dramatic narrative. So it's a lot of education in there. Mm -hmm. It didn't work in this country because he's up against organized Christianity. And he's plain about it. He's clear about it. Mm. Right from the top, right from the beginning. uh, uh, In the end scene in in the book where he has to sleep with Queequeg and he wakes up in the morning with Queequeg's arm around him as comfortable as an old married couple. And ultimately he says, well... You know, I'd really rather sleep with a pagan cannibal than some Christian men I know. And then he's going to say it in very plain terms when, Pip, you are in the arms of Queequeg, who has just pulled you out of the ocean. Right. And he's going to say And he sees that it. that's humanity. That's that right. That's, that's love, not, you know, this religion of... of Empty keeping... courtesy. Right, exactly. So Empty that's, courtesy. Yeah, that's a... I, I love that you tying... Especially linking that together because that is the moment that Greenhorn does realize, like, no, this person does not believe in the same Christian God that we're, you know, been taught to believe in, but he's still is showing compassion and love, and that is... The real is what, thing. Yes. Yeah. Versus very, it's religion. very impressive. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and the Christian uh, church was horrified at this book. And there was a campaign from what what I heard in a lecture just a couple of days ago, the Christian right, he called it, (laughs) which there was no such thing, but at any rate, uh, uh, there was a huge fundamentalist move in this country for Christianity, gigantic one, uh, two actually in the 19th century. And those people rose up and condemned this book. 
and that carried weight in the United States. Hmm. We get these Christian revivals now and again, and so we've had two in the nineteenth century. We're having what we've had two in in my lifetime. The Billy Graham Crusades was one, and now there's yet a new one that has come up in recent years uh, for during Trump's campaign. I think is when they they rose. So uh, you. What doomed that book was not the book. It was organized response against the book. Zeitgeist. Whatever's floating around. Yeah. And you never know what that's going to be. You know, America is a very young country. Oh. And if you, were to, <laughs> if you were to go back to uh, not even the discovery of uh, the, United, the United States, which is interesting to call columbus's journey of discovery when there were already people there they just moved yeah. in yeah. <laughs> you, know, you live here oh, okay now we do too yeah. um <laughs> but exactly. uh, so the country has only been a little more over 240 years old so where where was uh, europe in year oh, 240 funny. in the okay, middle uh, of the beginning of the dark ages i, I was <laughs> i was just in paris for the 350th anniversary of the founding of the paris opera mm-hmm <laughs> the opera house is a hundred years older than the, the well, U.S. Not the building, but the company. Yeah, yeah. the company. The yeah. company is a hundred years older than, than our nation. Mm -hmm. I was staying in a hotel a few years ago, also in Paris, mm -hmm. and the guy was talking to me about America's great hegemony in the world and how it's. Uh, he was talking about all this stuff. He says, "You know, Julianne, you need to realize something. The service stair that that I use to go quickly to my room." is 200 years older than the country I live in. <laughs> and he said, oh, there's something wrong with that. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, we're fairly young. And, yeah, uh, and, we're babies. Yeah. And considering how we cut off the older civilization that was here altogether, didn't participate at all, mm -hmm. and just started from scratch. Right. Um, we're, we're kids. And yes, and we the have, parents aren't home. <laughs> and the parents aren't home. Well, it does feel like that recently, yeah. doesn't it? Oh, like yeah. there, there are no, no grown ups in Washington. Oh, please. God. Well, then, at least. I think well. also all of us, we can agree that we're all immigrants in the sense. Oh, yeah. You know, like, for, me for the second time in my life. First, coming from Romania into Germany. And then on account of me rolling my R's back then when I went R and I couldn't go to the German R, oh, in the back, I was yeah. not very, very popular back then. Really? Oh, yeah. Oh, of course. I went to school. I started going to first grade uh, when, in 1983. And we had some very old teachers there in their 60s. And if you do the math, some of these guys were around during the Nazi years. So Jeez. they were not too happy about the foreign kids. And then when I when I came to uh, when I when I immigrated this country in 2002, back then riding the wave of Lerman's Bohem and all that, it was a very vastly different experience. Um, because all of a sudden, you know, I landed in New York. That's right. You have a Tony, don't you? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> oh my and gosh. we were somehow made our way to. But uh, it was a very different experience because arriving as an as a, as a foreigner to this country in New York. All of a sudden, you know, 17 street corners and 55 languages are being spoken with 75 cultures just dancing with each other. It's one of my favorite places in the world. Mm -hmm. San Francisco is very similar to that. Yes, it yeah. is. We are, really. Uh, I, I have a goddaughter in Paris. Mm. That's why I always go to Paris. Mm -hmm. And she was. She had a serious conversation with me uh, about how the European, well, the culture of France is under attack by all the immigrants coming in, so that the culture is mm. being lost. And and she said, aren't you having this too? Because we're having a, quote, problem with people coming over our southern border. I said, well, except, Julia, we don't have a culture. Mm -hmm. Right. And that, that's it's, it's, it's so all ironic. adopted from. Yeah, we don't have a culture. It's just, it's interesting because there also is like this conservative wave happening, not just in America. But also, it's worldwide. Yeah, because like with the Brexit, that happening, and then also the in morning, Brazil, there's things happening there that are just like... Oh, and, and, and every, everywhere. Yeah. It, 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 no, just it, from, from, from the Philippines to Turkey. Yeah. I mean, it's just everywhere. People yeah. are looking for a strong man. Fear people are scared. Is a, yeah. Fear is a powerful motivator. Yeah, people yeah. are scared. But in terms of culture, like you were saying, like, it's amazing. You can go anywhere 
And I mean, there are places in America where, you know, we do have different cultures, of course, but it's like America doesn't really have its own, like, food. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, like you can have, like, Cuban food or, mm -hmm. or Ethiopian or even, like, soul food. But that's well, oh, she's be careful about soul food, honey. <laughs> Southern cooking and soul food, you can get in the South. Yeah. That is true, yes. After that, that, yes. After that, I yes. wouldn't say yeah, sheer she's, perfect. She's crust pizza was invented here, so. <laughs> yes. But I'm just saying, it's just, I think America doesn't really have its own. You well, know, we have hamburgers, but that's not. Oh, but dude, even that is even, named after a city in Germany. Right. Hamburger. <laughs> so we don't have our own authentic. No, because we're a melting pot. We yeah. just have everything. Yeah. And I, I'm thinking about retiring in a few years. Not a, I haven't exactly set my date yet, but we're talking it through with the board and making a plan for my ultimate exit. And go, I'll be going back to the South, and not just to the South, but in a small town in the South. Right. And where you grew up, right? Well, actually, across, I was going to go where I grew oh, up. Okay. I changed my mind. I'm going to go to my university town oh, instead. Okay, okay, I think. Okay. Yeah, I think that's going to happen. Um, but... The thing I was going to miss is, gosh, within five blocks of my apartment, I have Korean, Chinese, Japanese, Indian, Italian, uh, Greek. It's just all around. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I have to learn how to cook. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not until you get to cities where you can have those variety, different variety of things. Yeah. But I, yeah. Yeah. But I totally understand. Yeah. Um, especially like being from Macon, Georgia. That has a. Are you from Macon? Yeah. My family came from Valdosta. Right. Okay. We were talking. Yeah. Okay. When we went into Florida. And then they. On the, on on the, the Hancock the side. Yes. yes. On okay. the Hancock side, they moved down from Valdosta and on the Simpson side from Cairo. Spelled C A I R O. Yes. Like the. <laughs> Like the, the town in Egypt. Of... Yes. <laughs> yes, but it's Cairo. There's also a Vienna. V I E N N A. <laughs> There's a lot of nice. European. Well, you know, well, uh, make it as Macron in oh. France. You've also got Augusta. Well, Augusta, is that, is that correlate with anyone? Well, Rome, Georgia. That's where I went to undergrad. Um, Shorter University, and then Athens. So there's all these like oh. European little Deland where I went to college. They called themselves the Athens of the South. Yeah, oh. <laughs> interesting. Because they they had the first school of higher learning uh, was built because Mr. S uh, what's his name Stetson, uh, who built who made the hats. He was really really very very wealthy, and he built a rather large house, <clears throat> a really rather large house uh, in Deland, and then endowed the little Deland Academy oh. with $18 million in 1880. Well, that was a fortune of money. Mm -hmm. And uh, they still have a huge... When, when, when I entered school, they told us plainly, in your freshman year, we're not going to be too hard on you because you're away from home for the first time and you have to get used to being... This. But in your sophomore year, we will do our best to fail you out of school <laughs> because we want small class loads for juniors and seniors. We don't want a lot of people in the class. So if there's any way to get you out of here when you're a sophomore, you're gone. And they did that. How nice. <laughs> they did that. Amazing. When I was a junior, my other class sizes were about 10 to 12. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and there were many classes where mm -hmm. it was just you and the prof. Composition was me and the prof. And the other students had a private lesson with the prof. Composition as in essays or no, music? No, writing music. Oh, beautiful. And then the, on oh, Friday, the faculty came in and played the pieces that you had all composed. So we heard our work. And that was in high school? And, no, that was college. Oh, gosh. Yeah, I was going to say, I was like, wait a second. Yeah. <laughs> no, like, no wow. not high school. It, he went to time. Hogwarts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's what it would take. That's, yeah. <laughs> no, in high school, I didn't know what music theory was. Uh, but uh, they, were, they were tough at that university, and they meant to be. I think they're easier now, but they're still supposed to be very good. I don't know. Hmm. So uh, back, back to On the Sea, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, you, be uh, Pip, you become a, a, a favorite of Ahab, and you're very concerned with Ahab. You, you're trying to warn Ahab. Mm -hmm. You get involved with him. Where, and, and you, as Starbuck, mm. are very concerned with Ahab and try to warn Ahab. Right. So only the two of you are involved with him in that way, and you're warning him that he's going to die. Yes. And you're warning him that he's going to kill everybody. Yeah. 
And I have the one chance to avert it, and I don't take it. Because you're not a murderer. Well, yeah, and also the big coin dropped for me on the first evening. um, I was actually rehearsing that night as Stubb, and I was listening to Richard... um, half singing, half yearning the end of act one with this almost infantile, as in like a childlike suffer, suffocated scream. And it's it's that vulnerability that that's completely disarms Starbuck. And oh, when he starts uh, in his sleep. When he starts, he weeping, starts in weeping in his sleep. And, yeah. and calling out in his sleep. And, uh, you know, the music then does the rest when it goes da-da-da-dee-da-da-da-da and the chorus goes mm-hmm, and Ashraf singing Fune-a-la. All of it happening so all good. It's oh, so good. Peggy is yeah, yeah. just brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> it's, he's the first composer, composer to whom I ever wrote a fan letter. Oh, oh yeah. wow. Well, his music's so, it's so cinematic and, well, especially in this opera, but it's just something... Very grounded that I feel with Jake Heggie's music. Yeah. He gets accessible. the emotion. Yes, accessible. it's extremely accessible. And if you get, let's say, oh, you had pierces you. Yeah. yeah. And, and let's say you have fifteen hundred people in the theater. I I promise you there will be, you know, if you c- could color code them, you would have a, a pip fraction people that identify with pip, people identifying with Starbuck, people identifying with Flask or Stubb or, or Ahab, of course, Greenhorn. or the Whale or Greenhorn, and not just kind of. <laughs> but actually feeling connected to them and rooting and, for them. And this you know? is the wonderful combination of Melville, mm-hmm. who gives us real people, and you find out a lot about them. It's a long book. You need a mm-hmm. long book to tell that much about a lot of individuals, mm-hmm. and there are a lot of people in this show. Yeah. And yet you reach into them, mm-hmm. and Ahab is sort of the least explored. He's mm-hmm. the most black and white character. Mm-hmm. But I see him as a little different because I see Ahab as a guy who has presumed the scriptures that men have dominion over the earth. Yeah, I would say so. He w- he probably and was more he, like Greenhorn when he set out. He when he first so. started, when I was a boy yeah. at, of yeah. eighteen, he even says you know. so to Starbuck. Mm-hmm. And but now. He has had the big insult. Mm-hmm. A brute animal has changed his life, has insulted mm-hmm. him. And he can't adjust to that. He can't accept that fall from grace. And there's a point that, that he says, and the whale is just a mask. This isn't in the opera. The whale is just the mask of the thing I'm after. So he's going after nature itself. He's going after God. God's creation. He's going after God because he has been insulted. I would smite the sun if it insulted me. His self-respect is under attack. Yeah, Mm -hmm. ego. It's just pure ego. Yeah, extreme. No, it's... Don't get on that boat. So anyway, this thing is filled with energy and filled with power mm-hmm. from the begin from the get go, straight through. Um, and it goes by so fast. I mean, the other day when we when we did it back to uh, two yeah, days ago, your Saturday it, run. Yeah, it was it was over like this, and you know, of course, the commitment and the physicality about it is phenomenal. But you're engaged every second. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and you have to be. Yeah, I mean, when we're on stage, clearly. Yeah. But, but also by, from 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 watching, I'm I'm always uh, I'm always triggered as the listener to wanting to find out more, and that's after the fifth, sixth, seventh viewing. I still, I still want to hear the final aria with Greenhorn sitting on the coffin, or when you're floating and you're doing your beep, 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 which almost sounds like an echo load. Beep, beep. When you think about it, <laughs> you don't even think of it that yeah. way. But that's well, yeah. once you, you know, you you would not want my Romanian brain, I don't think. <laughs> but once you have that, all sorts of avenues open up. <laughs> and the indication was it's the heart monitor that we see in yeah. with patients and that, that yeah. little spike with the little beep every time. Yeah. That's what Eugene was talking about. Actually, I have a question. 
yeah. for you, Jasmine. Yes. The one thing that uh, I've meant to ask you, and right now might be <laughs> a good idea, when Ahab says to you, "Go down to my cabin, and there you find Pip," do you understand? Mm. Is, does he essentially ask you to go down, get over yourself, and come back as the normal, jovial character we all love, or what does he? What is? What do you think he means by that? You know, I think. I, I, I don't know if it's a matter of, of getting it back to the jovial pit, but I think it's p- partly, I think, one, he wants to get him away just from the situation. But I really feel like it's just a caring moment that it's like, I know you've completely lost yourself, but the place where you're used to being... Mm-hmm. That's where maybe, yeah, you could possibly yeah. find Because instead yourself. of telling him, you'll find some ointment and bandages because yeah. your hands are bleeding profusely. Yeah, and I'm saying I'm looking for, yeah. the, you know, five feet high. Mm-hmm. I'm describing myself in, in that short scene and knowing, also predicting my death. Mm-hmm. Um, I really just feel like it's a, it, it, I get what you're saying. It is a sense of like, he's asking him to go back to yeah. just... Because of all the things you could say in that moment, <laughs> that would be at the bottom of the list. Right, Go right. find yourself. Like the, yeah. the, the, the few times that my son would fall off his bike, the last, I would never tell him, now you take your bloody self, <laughs> go to the bathroom, and then find my son, will you? <laughs> what? Try it, see what works. Yeah, see what happens. <laughs> yeah, and I think it's to give him a solution to, or an you. answer to the yeah. problem that I'm looking for Pip and... and yeah. I can't find. Yeah. I can't You'll find him in my cabin. Yeah. Just to calm him down because right. he's panicked and freaked. Right. And it's kind of like when, if someone has like yeah. Alzheimer's or something and they're saying something just completely out of their mind. You're like, you know what? It's it's over there. The You're looking for yeah. the cat or whatever. It's right over there just to diffuse the situation. But but it, I think it is a, more of a caring moment yeah. where you see that he's trying to... Speaking of diffuse situations, do you mind if I ask her another question? Oh, yeah. Um, you're the only girl on board. Yeah. <laughs> Tell oh, me what it's, what it's like. <laughs> what it's like to come to rehearsal with that, especially when the chorus is in-house. Do you remember the first three days of chorus rehearsals? Every phrase I sang was like, the frist is over from Flying Dutchman. It was just supposed to be a conversation. We're going, oh. And I'm thinking, how does Jasmine feel? Oh, and in this case, Seanette, with this wave of testosterone going. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I, I think when the first time I did it in Utah, it was a completely different experience because that was the first time I'd ever been like uh-huh. the only female <laughs> of the show but like it was it's it was it's I'm, in both environments it's been really wonderful and mm. everyone has been wonderful colleagues and i've felt you know um safe Embraced. And yes <laughs> yeah Great. so i i um i had a lot to learn and watch mm. um being that i don't do many pants rolls because yeah. in the soprano repertoire there's not many was Oscar, which is something that you know I could definitely potentially do, but um, that's about it. Right yeah, now. so it's not something that I'm used to practicing, um, but it's it's fun to learn mm. and and it's you know it's you know I have my own dressing room because I, nice. I was thinking the other day, <laughs> least, you, know? you know, the, the guy who's covering me, Will who's about yeah, half yeah. a foot taller than me. Yeah. And I'm 6'1". And I'm thinking, so if I go on a Starbucks and Will is stop and he's standing um, next to you. Oh, it's... It's yeah. like you, you better bring your mountaineering gear <laughs> to, to yeah. climb to the... <laughs> yeah, but I feel that way most of yeah. the time. <laughs> yeah. I, <laughs> because I'm 5'1". And yeah. it's, Alexander is... You said you, oh, your yeah, husband is 6'4"? He's, he's... Oh, no. no he's no, not 6'4". He's, six, four. he's like 5'11", 6'4". Oh, 5'11". Okay, yeah. okay, okay, okay. He's He's not six four, but yeah. there is a height difference. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, my dear friends, we have reached the end of our time together. Speaking yeah. of, time flies by, it and it does. does. Yeah. These podcasts are always so much fun. Yeah, yeah. Just have a good time. Yeah. Thank you for having. This is like my first podcast ever. I've never done one before, so this is. I'm glad that we're talking about Moby Dick. And well, I was, was absolutely going to have Pip in a podcast. Yeah, great. That was going to happen. Pip in a podcast. That could be a running thing for you. That, <laughs> Think hey. about it, Jasmine. That actually could. Okay, well, All right. thanks for Thank making you, time Lynn. to come in. It was such a pleasure to talk to you. And everybody, you. bring your friends. Come see us 
on the jumble gym known as Moby Dick. Yes, <laughs> it's going to be fantastic. Okay, thanks, guys. Bye-bye.